Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless this takes us to new mexico and uh, we are looking here at the website for the Satanic Temple. They're going to launch a reproductive health clinic in the state offering abortion services. The controversial story spreading all over the internet, of course. Shalice Blythe, a minister of Satan, joins us live to talk a little bit more about this and the reasoning behind it. First off, just kind of explain to me what's going on. So just to uh, uh, clarify what exactly we're doing, um, so the Satanic Temple has already launched um, a telehealth uh, religious abortion clinic that is um, providing material support for those who want to have uh, to engage in the religious abortion ritual. So how this will work is uh, prospective patients will complete a brief confidential online screening form and review information on performing TST's religious abortion ritual. A telehealth video appointment with uh, licensed health care <laughs> practitioners uh, will uh, then be scheduled and eligible patients will then be able to order uh, medication from our partner pharmacy. So uh, this is a telehealth clinic. Uh, this is no brick and mortar. Um, we are uh, providing abortifacients. So the um, the two um, abortifacient pills, uh, we are not uh, providing any surgical services. So after uh, the patient is approved, uh, the medication will then be discreetly packaged and arrived uh, in the mail two to three days after the order is placed. And then of course, uh, our staff will be available to patients by phone, text or video chat every step of the way. And we also provide ordained ministers to assist in the religious abortion ritual itself. Walk me through the temple's views when you're talking about abortion and things of that nature. As Satanists, um, we are guided by our sincere and deeply held beliefs. And so those beliefs hold that we have an inviolable right to make decisions about our own bodies and that those decisions are ours alone to make and should be based on our best scientific understanding of the world. We also hold that when either of these things are violated or under threat by laws and institutions, it is our duty to stand firm against them. So um, when we talk about the topic of abortion, I mean, I know there's always a lot of rhetoric surrounding um, you know, when life begins and, you know, the, the morality of the topic of abortion. But um, since the morality of abortion, you know, tends to stem from a religious point of view, we do not, uh, we do not view abortion as the killing of an individual living being that is separate from the pregnant person. So does a woman have to join uh, the satanic temple to actually use these services or is it open to everyone? Um, our services are open to anybody who, uh, pursuant to their deeply held religious beliefs or deeply held beliefs, um, want to partake in the religious abortion ritual. There is a correlation between child sacrifice in the Old Testament and modern day abortion. The Bible contains the heartbreaking tale of child sacrifice practiced in the name of Molech, a god of the Ammonites. Molech worship was practiced by the Ammonites and Canaanites who revered Molech as a protecting father figure. Images of Molech were made of bronze and their outstretched arms were heated and red hot. Living children were then placed into the idol's hands and died there or were rolled into a fire pit below. God gave the people of Israel a dire warning concerning child sacrifice and Molech worship as we read in Leviticus 20 verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Again, ye shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel, or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Sadly, King Solomon became involved in this horrendous practice, as recorded in 1 Kings 11, 6-8. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, 
the abomination of Moab on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and from Alek, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Later, the evil king Manasseh offered his own son as a sacrifice, as did King Ahaz. The people of Judah also participated in this crime against their own sons, a sin so detestable that God said it had never even crossed his mind, as we read in Jeremiah 32, 35. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. In modern society, unprecedented numbers of children have been sacrificed at the hands of abortionists for the sake of convenience, immorality, and pride. Millions of babies have been sacrificed so that their parents can maintain a certain lifestyle. God hates hands that shed innocent blood, and we can be sure that God will judge this horrendous sin. There is good news for anyone who has had an abortion, and that is that God offers forgiveness to anyone who confesses their sins, as we read in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus said, as a sign of His coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. We begin with Israel expanding its operation against Hamas, taking on the terrorists in Hamas's capital in southern Gaza, while also trying to protect civilians. Israeli troops are involved in fierce fighting on the ground, while the Air Force launching strikes as well. And as Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, the U.S. believes the main part of the war may be over by January. The IDF chief of staff says a new phase of the military campaign has begun. In the last few days, we have moved to the third phase of the ground operations. We have secured many Hamas strongholds in the northern Gaza Strip, and now we are operating against its strongholds in the south. Israeli forces are fighting now in Khan Yunus, the capital of Hamas in the southern Gaza Strip. The Biden administration reportedly expects the current phase to be over by January and warns Israel the window of time Israel has to finish the operation is closing. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu emphasizing that after the war, Gaza must be demilitarized and only the IDF can be trusted to do it. No international force can be responsible for this. We've seen what happens in other places when international forces were brought for the goal of demilitarization. I'm not ready to close my eyes and accept any other arrangement. Netanyahu also railed against the UN and others for not speaking up about the sexual violence by Hamas. I say to the women's rights organizations, to the human rights organizations, you've heard of the rape of Israeli women, horrible atrocities, sexual mutilation. I expect all civilized leaders, governments, nations, to speak up against this atrocity. Meanwhile, as the fighting between Israel and Hamas terrorists begins its third month, it's straining much of the country's economy. Given the number of military reservists supporting the fight, local farms are short on manpower. I mean, a lot of the dads and the men have been called up for reserves and they go to fight in Gaza. And so that leaves this area and yeah, there's not, there's no one to harvest. So it's, it's a need that needs done. And yeah, we just wanted to help out with that. That's where a group of American cowboys has stepped in, traveling to Israel on their own dime to help fill the gap. Once I got the call, I dropped everything and headed right over. The farmers here are suffering big time. 
So because we've worked in this area for 20 years, obviously we're not going to leave our farmers. We've got 100, 120 farmers in this region that we've helped. But the strain on Israel's economy is not only in its fields, but in the high-tech sector, finances, and trade. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's foreign policy is pretty simple. If you bless Israel, you will be blessed. If you curse Israel, you will be cursed. This morning, warnings on Capitol Hill of rising tensions as Americans grapple with the fallout from the Israel-Hamas war here at home. FBI Director Christopher Wray delivering a stark message Tuesday. I've never seen a time where all the threats or so many of the threats are all elevated, all at exactly the same time. Saying since the Hamas attacks inside Israel on October 7th, the FBI has been working around the clock to fight growing threats inside the U.S. Asked if he'd compare it to the blinking warning lights before 9-11, Ray said this. I see blinking lights everywhere I turn. And the FBI director also noting that the agency is tracking a massive rise in threats to the Jewish community. That warning also being heard on college campuses, which have seen a spike in anti-Semitism. Presidents from MIT, UPenn and Harvard were also on Capitol Hill Tuesday, grilled on their responses. Does that speech not call for the genocide of Jews and the elimination of Israel? When you speech... testify that you understand that is the def definition of intifada. Is that speech according to the code of conduct or not? We embrace a commitment to free expression and give a wide berth to free expression, even of views that are objectionable. Debating how to protect both student safety while still protecting free speech. Calling for the genocide of Jews violates Harvard code of conduct, correct? Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. What the world doesn't understand is that this is a spiritual war fought in the physical realm. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet Earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. The aftermath of an attack. Ukrainian authorities reported deaths by Russian shelling in the southern city of Kherson. They are the latest fatalities in months of persistent shelling by Moscow's forces. The shelling lasted for almost two hours. It was in Kherson, in the center of the city. As a result, two people died, one woman, 33 years old, and a man, 46 years old. Ukrainian forces recaptured Kherson just over a year ago, but it remains targeted by Russian forces on the opposite side of the Dnipro River that runs next to the city. With the war continuing on multiple fronts in Ukraine and with no end in sight, Ukrainians are bracing themselves for winter. In a village in the Mykolaiv region, northwest of Kherson, many of the buildings are in ruins. One resident, though, is trying to fix what he can to his house to have shelter from the cold. I hope it can be rebuilt. Russia's full-scale invasion began in February 2022. The Ukrainian army and civilians are facing a second full winter of war. Powerful cascading torrents tore across communities near Seattle. Fueled by days of drenching rain, dangerous walls of water triggered flood alerts for some 9 million across the Pacific Northwest. At least five raging rivers are threatening to breach their banks, some already partially submerging homes, 
cars and roads. It doesn't matter if it's a couple inches or a full foot um, of water or anything in between. It's a very dangerous situation. In Oregon, the flash flooding turned deadly as emergency teams race from rescue to rescue. The Coast Guard swooping in to pluck one driver from their truck while also hoisting another family from their home after it was surrounded by rising water. With three major storms dumping a conveyor belt of steady rain, up to eight inches could fall across the Pacific Northwest by Thursday. I didn't expect for it to rise this quickly. A waterlogged region desperate to dry out, but this morning still on the brink of disaster. This is what's happened to the hillside town of Katesh. Days of torrential rains washed away cars and brought down buildings. Dozens of people have died. We have been highly affected by the floods and mud flow. It was around 6 a.m. when it started raining. Later on, it started flooding. Until now, it has affected most of our business. We no longer have shops and many houses have been destroyed, but also many families have lost their beloved ones. A sea of mud in the town in northern Tanzania hasn't helped the rescue efforts. More than a hundred people have been injured and many others have lost their homes. They join more than a million people who've been left homeless across East Africa in recent weeks. The community here gathered to bury the dead. Meteorologists predicted the heavy rains, which they say are connected to the El Nino climate cycle in the Pacific Ocean and made worse by climate change. I call upon my fellow Tanzanians to continue being patient, especially now during this most difficult time. A disaster which cost more than 63 lives of our fellow Tanzanians. Let us continue praying to God for us to remain calm during our time of grief. As more than 170 governments meet in Dubai for the UN's climate change conference, the number of coffins in East Africa is growing. Campaigners say the summit's dominated by representatives of the fossil fuel industry, whose emissions need to be cut for people here to be safe. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real, and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. You had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, 
Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. We're coming on the air with breaking news of a shooting at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. Details are still coming in, but let me tell you what we know right now. Police say there are multiple victims. Their conditions are unknown. Las Vegas officers also say the shooter has been located and is dead. Reports of shots fired started coming in just before noon Pacific time. And at least one building on the campus, UNLV, also posted on social media. There were reports of shots fired in the student union, and they urged people to evacuate the area and run, hide, or fight. Now to breaking news overnight, at least six people were killed in Texas. Aaron Katursky is here with the latest on that investigation. Overnight, Austin police said these shootings and murders were the work of a single gunman, but they didn't know it until his arrest after an eight-hour spate of violence. It began just before 11 a.m. Tuesday with the inexplicable shooting of an Austin Independent School District police sergeant. An hour later, police were called to the scene of a double homicide. Later in the day, someone on a bicycle was shot and police responded to a burglary call at a home where an officer came under fire. There was a shootout with the suspect who fled. Inside the home, there were two people found dead. The shooter was finally caught on the outskirts of Austin and police linked him to a double murder in San Antonio. In total, six dead, three others shot, thankfully with non-life-threatening injuries in a wild day in Texas, guys. Can you feel it? Can you sense it? Something is changing in our world. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. One of the many signs that we are living in the last days is that men would be lovers of themselves, as we read in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Every characteristic listed after men would be lovers of themselves illustrates what men do when they love themselves above God. When you jump down to verse 13, the Bible states, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It is very evident that evil is getting worse and deception is off the charts. Godlessness is now taking over all aspects of society. Imagine you're a chaperone on your 18-year-old daughter's you know, school trip. It's an overnight. And yet you find out during the trip that she's being forced to share a bed with a biological male. Yeah, that happened. Serena Wales doesn't have to imagine this scenario. It did happen to her and her family. She says her daughter called her in a panic from the bathroom of the hotel saying that she didn't want to share a bed with a biological boy. Serena joins me now exclusively along with her husband, Joe Wales, and their attorney, Tyson Langhofer from the Alliance Defending Freedom. Serena, it's stunning that you were on this trip as a chaperone. Thank God you were there during the summer, but then in another room. So you were in the other room. What happened when you asked uh, for your 11-year-old daughter to move rooms? My 11-year-old daughter and myself were on a cross-country trip to Philly and D.C. And on the first night of the trip, our daughter discovered that she was unknowingly assigned to share a bed with a boy who identifies as a girl. Your daughter is going to be in a bed with a boy. Mm -hmm. And this is when your mm -hmm. wife is on the trip. I, these facts are so mind-blowing to me. I can't even believe them. But, Joe, at this point, you know, did you consider pulling your daughter out of the trip and just saying, we're, we're out of here? I mean, you weren't there, but at that point, I would have hit the road and probably moved schools, but that's just me. Yeah, honestly, that was my first reaction. And as we sat and we talked about it, we didn't want to take the trip away from our daughter. She didn't do anything wrong. We didn't do anything wrong, so we didn't want to take the trip from her. She looked forward to the trip for quite some time. Serena, what happened when you asked to have your daughter move rooms? When we were able to finally do it, we, she and I were not able to discuss what happened with anybody else on the trip. We were told to hide it because to protect all of the students that were on the trip. Wait a second. You're trying to <laughs> control your freedom of expression as, a, as, a, as, a, as your daughter's expression and your concern. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. You know, this is... Uh, <laughs> You know, the CCP land, you can't, you can't, you can't speak the truth anymore. 
almost everything in this world has been perverted. The truth is being turned into lies and lies into the truth. Nothing seems to make sense anymore, at least to a righteous person, those that believe in Jesus Christ. Being transgender is at odds with science and God's design as we read in Genesis 126 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Somehow, in some mysterious and wonderful way, the human male and female in both body and spirit are the image and likeness of God. Satan hates mankind because we are created in God's image. He is sowing confusion in the minds of our children. And he is busy in these last days devouring those who are not steadfast in the faith, as we read in 1 Peter 5, 8-11. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.